Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and for this week, a week that we call holy, a week that we remember both your passion and your sacrifice for us. Lord, uh, remind us as we open our study today that uh, the, the cause of our study and the purpose of our study is to learn what you have won for us. And so open our hearts and minds to receive your word and to look forward with it with eager anticipation. It's because of Christ that we can do these things, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, good morning. Sorry for yelling at you. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. You're right. You're right. I don't know if I'll have any voice left to continue that into the second service, but I'm hoping to. We'll see. Uh, we, were, um, we left off last week. We got off track a little bit, but we left off on this slide where we were talking about um, we broke out two different kinds of eschatological understandings. Eschatological um, studies are the studies of the end times. Okay, We talked about inaugurated um, eschatology, which means those features of the end times that have already come to occurrence, and we've contrasted it with future eschatological things that are coming. So the future uh, end times gifts that are coming to us is really where we're focusing our time right now. Um, our inaugurated eschatological times are the fact, and sometimes this is easy to forget, but that the kingdom has already come for us. We are already participants in the inaugurated eschatological times. So as we gather for worship, we know that we're gathering around the Word, and we know that Jesus is the Word, and He's the Lamb who's in the midst of His throne, and His people are gathered around it and receiving the Word of peace. So we're living in those times. When we worship in church, when we sit in here and we hear and read the Word, we can take this Word in peace. You know what? I don't have to worry about dying and being eternally damned. I am redeemed. I'm a baptized child of Christ. And so I'm a current participant in the gifts of the kingdom. When we commune, as many of you just came from worship services and you just communed, you are eating at the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom, which has no end. You've you got a seat at the table already. That's inaugurated eschatology. We want to talk about future eschatological times that God has in store for us. And they're just like there's two ways we have to talk about the eschatological times, we have to talk about the way it's revealed in Scripture. Either via new creation, because the Bible talks that way, or it also talks in terms of total annihilation of everything and a recreation of all things new. Which is right. Both are in Scriptures. Okay? So you need to understand that both are there, and there's, um, there's a certain degree of, of, I don't want to say unclarity, because that would be denying the perspicuity of the Scriptures. I would just say that there's some mystery to it. In, in preparation, I worked on preparation A, preparation B, preparation C. I made it all the way through preparation I got it up to preparation G, and today we're going to deal with preparation H. So I stole that from, from uh, Austin Powers. Thank you. I got a, um, I have a, uh, it's called, uh, it's a two-volume work from Concordia Publishing House where I've drawn some additional resources for this um, called Confessing the Gospel, and it's a systematic theology, um, a work that lists um, Basically, what a systematic theologian does is they go through the scriptures and they sort of precipitate out like on any topic and then they build an index around it and you can look things up. So, as I was looking on last things, eschatological times, um, I found a piece on eternal life. And uh, I read it and, and I had to chuckle because part of it was like, this is, it sort of says what we know, but it doesn't really say much. <laughs> because it only says what we know. And so what I chose to do was to run it off for you guys, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send a few down the, the, each aisle here, and if you take maybe one per household, we can get a couple here. But it's, um, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to give it to you for your perusal on your own time, because there's a lot of Bible, um, a lot of Bible references that are some look-up things that you can do. But 
after I read it, I thought, oh, I'm hoping to find some nice little nugget here that I can, you know, go to class with you guys and share with you that it talks about some of these future eschatological realities that are yet to come. And um, you guys will all be all the wiser for it. And after I read it, I go, well, yeah, I agreed to all those things, but, but that doesn't really say much. <laughs> so you might be thinking, why is he giving me a handout that doesn't say much? Well, because I care. That's why. If there's not enough, um, I may run out of these. So if, if I do, um, and you've got extras, you got some extras, good. I'll leave these right here, and that may be enough for this table. And again, I'm not going to review this with you because I think that'll take us um, down a different path than I'm ready to go here today, but yes, sir. Oh, he's got chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Rich, before church, he just handed me chocolate now, but before church, he walked up and he says, um, are you going to be there for snacks during adult Bible class? And I said, I hope so, <laughs> if the Lord wills. And then he says, well, read this. And he pulls a thing out of his jacket. And it says, um, uh, how did it say it, Rich? Oh, it's right here. It says, um, yeah, just give me the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. <laughs> That's my mantra for living. So, so what? you, you don't need to, um, I gave you the handout because I'd like for you to, to spend a little time maybe and study. This would be a great week to do it, but to look at what God has in store that we can glean from the work of these um, systematic theologians that speaks about the new creation. I was struck by the fact that, um, I just did a, a glance over it, but they didn't mention the two different um, theories that I'm going to share with you, the annihilation versus new creation. So we're going to go a little further than what this particular systematic theologi uh, theology work um, gives us. So a couple of readings that are up there. Um, we started into this last week, so I left us right off where we were last week at Christ's second coming. So this is in that day and, and everything that comes beyond that. Um, the earth and the sky will flee is what the scriptures say. So Revelation 20, then I saw a great white throne, him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. There was no place found for them. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from his place. And then Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, the sea was no more. So there's the sort of the, how did it go away? How did it get gone? Was it burned up, like Peter writes? Or did God just do away with it? Last week I shared with you um, that we had to do some reading in this book called Hammer of God by Bo Geertz. Uh, this book is written by an, an older Swedish theologian. And um, we had several different sections, but basically what the book in summary is all about is um, it's a, a church in rural Sweden and different uh, points of time and observations are sort of fictional accounts of what happened in this church during different sort of periods of time throughout the church's history and, and the men who served the church. And it's, it's sort of written around the experience of the pastors, but I told you last week that I wished I had the book out here with me because I'd read to you on it. And we were right about at this point. And so this week I brought it. And I, I understand the, the difficulties sometimes of being read to. So I want you guys to sort of get your mindsets like we're like a preschool class. And we're going to get a story time read to us here for a little bit. But with regard to the, the earth and the sky fleeing away on that day, I think um, the author Geertz does an amazing job here. And I'm, I want to read some of this because it just, I remember the first time I read it thinking, it sort of encompasses everything that's in the scriptures about it, but it puts it into, a, you know how like when you have a story read to you, it sort of puts a, uh, images on it. When the Lord of the Rings trilogy was put out by Peter Jackson, I, I loved it, but I hated it. because I loved it because it did away with my images of having read those books when I was a kid. It eliminated those and it put into my head, you know, director Peter Jackson's images of what he envisioned and his vision of what that you know, those scenes must have looked like. And, and so I think that can happen sometimes, even like when you talk about, like we talked about The Chosen last week and how that's one director's vision. Well, this, this is a Bo Geertz's vision. An endless road stretched towards the horizon. It was bordered by tall poplars, which swayed and rustled in the storm. A strange warm wind, heavy with humidity and noxious fumes, swept across the fields and robbed those outdoors in the night of their breath. 
It must have been early dawn now, and the low clouds that tumbled their twisted shapes in the sky showed in their rifts a pale light, which was like a streak of blood trembling in the gray sky. Torvik, that's the pastor, Torvik, a Swedish name, walked as though in a dream. He scarcely felt the ground on which he trod. With every step, he was lifted from the road by the terrific onset of the oncoming storm. In the semi-darkness, he caught a glimpse of other figures, all of them walking in the same direction, bent forward in the wind with outstretched necks and half-closed eyes and faces that appeared a ghostly white in the pale light, when suddenly it brightened. A fiery light beamed high above the clouds, and it fell from the vaulted heavens earthward in waves of light that spread into the night in ever-widening circles. Wave followed upon wave till the light reached the horizon of the plain in glittering surf. The clouds seemed to roll onward in enraged carmine shapes, while in the azure zenith a whiteness of unbearable brilliance was being revealed. A sound with the ring of steel cut through the storm, a trembling, brittle, metallic tone as if the very dome of heaven had been set in vibration by a mighty blow. The sound became more intense. It was a whining roar, a wild and anguished crashing, hiding within it infinite depths of darkest terror. Existence itself was being shattered. Far beyond the possibilities of all earthly laws of sound, a primeval thunder rolled and crashed, laden with annihilating power and overwhelming terror. High above all earthly light shone an unfathomable and indescribable brightness. The dome of heaven was being riven, and the power was revealing itself, and it descended, overmastering and annihilating in its might. Torvik saw how the poplar leaves shriveled and the last living branches drooped toward the ground as if the life in them had been commanded to withdraw. He saw people throw themselves headlong to the ground, hiding their faces in their hands. He was enveloped by light and gripped by the power. He felt that it had filled his innermost being and he sensed how it possessed him and it had always possessed him. Freedom and self-sufficiency faded like empty illusions. Everything was infinitely dependent and unconditionally bound to the unspeakable. Life was not his own, but it flowed into him every second from above. He felt fear and trembling that that flow could be broken at any time and that his body could at any moment succumb to death and dissolution like the withering trees. He realized that everything was a gift and a loan that every cell in his tissues acknowledged the power as its source and owner. Power is capitalized with a P. That the infinite was the one with the life in his members and pulsed warmly through his very fingertips, pumping the blood through the arteries, holding his psyche together so that the chain of his thoughts didn't even break. The quivering sound shot through the sea of light and everything was enveloped by the penetrating peal of trumpets. Earth trembled and gave way, and the void was filled with glittering, reverberating chords. Christ is coming, he thought, and the kingdom of heaven is like a king who takes account of his servants. Now I'm going to skip. There's a whole section about his, his experiences from earlier in the story that I don't want to go through with you, but it's about how it's like pages turning. And the voice starts reading from these pages. Now, remember I told you about in Revelation 20, books were opened. And the account of people's lives were re recounted in the books. So that's kind of what's going on. But then I want to I pick up. Um, if I can find it. Oh, I should have marked it. <laughs> Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> well, maybe I didn't mark where I need to pick up back on it. Eh, if I don't find it here. I should have just kept reading and not told you anything. See, then you'd have just thought I meant to do that. Uh, there we go. I'm not going to pick up on this, but I'm losing you. There we go. 
Oh, here we go. Only one thought possessed him, how to get away, how to hide himself in the earth, to feel the rocks and the cliffs crashing over his head, but there was no place to hide. He sank into empty nothingness. He felt an enveloping darkness underneath, a concentrated evil will possessed with the satanic joy of destruction. It widened into a gaping, a gaping abyss, a black pit of eternal terror, to the bottom of which he fell with dizzying swiftness. His chest was constricted as if by bands of steel, and a shout of horrible anguish came like a dry, hot stream over his lips. The next instant, he again rested on something solid. He heard the familiar squeak of the steel springs of his tourist bed and saw some pale reflections dancing on the ceiling between his big brown... Well, okay, well, that's when he wakes up from this whole dream. So he wakes up from you know, this picturing of what what God's plan or intent was that, you know, earth and sky would flee, flee away from him. This is sort of the moment of judgment, and it really, um, to me, captures this business of, is it annihilation? Is it the destruction of these things? Or is it just, as, as he, I think, notes neatly in that piece, he recognizes that it was always being supported by this God, this entity, and it's just that his whole life he was not in a position of realization of it. I think that's what you'll find even as you read this piece from the, from the theology that I printed for you, is that we can say some things about it, and certainly we're relying on the book of Revelation, but we have to remember, and I believe this piece that I handed out to you says this, some of these things you know, are coming from a vision. So just like Torvik was in a dream and he was recounting his dream for us, is this the reality of it, or is this, is this someone, John in this case, struggling to put to words what it is that God is revealing to him it's going to look like? I, I don't know, per se. And, and, you know, part of my goal with this class when we first began it, when I first started putting this material together, was to say, I want to take away some of the, the myths that people have um, supported and undergirded with their own lives and their own thinking and replace these myths with what the scriptures say, which, as you'll see if you do some looking up on these things, the scriptures don't give us a lot of stuff to firmly grasp on with the exception of saying there is a future. And that future eschatological reality is coming which is where we move on from. So 2 Peter 3, according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth. So it's new. Did you have to destroy the old to arrive at the new? You know, you think of like a body transformation. You know, like somebody, they, you know, they sort of get to a point where they've, they've gotten into a, some bad health habits and they, you know, maybe somebody that you went to school with or you go back to an old class reunion and you see somebody, wow, they've really let themselves go. And then you go pick up at a later class reunion, and, and they look fantastic. They've completely reworked themselves. Well, the old, are they destroyed? You know, is that part of them something that's annihilated? You know, maybe they worked the fat off and they burnt it off. Or, you know, are they just a new creation altogether? you know, with a new outlook on life. I think there's a little bit of both that you could say. You know, is that, a, is that sort of a good analogy or is that a bad analogy? I don't know. But we're waiting for this new heavens and a new earth. Now, one of the features, one of the unequivocal features of this new heaven that we will occupy in that day is that righteousness will dwell there. And that's another piece that we talked about at the end of our time last time. As I said, if you want to imagine a little bit of what this is going to look like, it's hard to imagine but imagine if it was a place where people all lived according to the Ten Commandments. Bizarro world. Seriously, if you imagine people truly living according to the Ten Commandments, kids would obey their parents. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can from looking right. <laughs> you know, um, pastors would ignore posted speed limits. <laughs> Uh, you know, you get the picture. Like, if everybody did this stuff, we obeyed the authorities. We, you know, in the, in the words of this morning's sermon, kind of, we lived according to God's will and not our own. So, instead of living 
for the personal glorification of the win, we worry about the needs of others first because that's what Christ did for us. Just that alone would be bizarro world. Wouldn't it? I mean, to have people doing that. And, and to me, you know, that sort of encompasses what God's got. In, it's one of the features of what God's got in store for us. When we say new here, this actually is something that's in that piece that I copied and handed out to you. We say new in terms of new in quality. Um, when, uh, when you're on the Price is Right and you win a new car, Right? Yeah, yeah, you don't really win a new car. You're going to be paying taxes on it and stuff like that. It's a new car, but the second you turn the ignition on that new car, it's not a new car anymore. Right? So, is it new in terms of new quality, in its qualities? It might, when we say new, if you think of the meanings of the word new, and, and I used this with you one other time too, where I said when we start to talk about these things, we've got to remember that all language is analogous. That means it speaks in terms of analogy. It, it represents something, but it may represent something much larger. So when I say that, you know, Jesus says I'm making all things new. Does that mean he's recreating me? Refashioning me into me like a brand new something? A new figure? A new form? Um, you know, we think of a newborn baby, but even a baby, the moment that it comes out of the womb, isn't really new because it was new at the moment of conception. It was a new thing at that moment, but it's been developing and changing, and we say newborn baby, but it's really, it's, it's already had time in development. So it's developed into something new. And then, you know, we don't stay babies. Right? We grow up and our bodies change and morph into something different. They age. And so when we talk about something new, is he saying new as in it's a brand new thing, recreated? Well, this is where this theology of the body becomes sort of important. Because God made you, as we've talked, the way that he wanted you. And his plans are to use these bodies that we occupy because he holds them in such high regard, because he created them in his image, he's going to raise them from the dead. And he's going to rejoin your soul with this body. Well, that has some ramifications in this life. That means I'm going to take care of this body, because it was never my own. I'm only a steward of it. And again, that's a piece from that hammer of God that I think resonated with me, was you know, that Torvik recognized the fact that his psyche, his cells... Literally everything in him was powerless apart from the power that was going into him, supported by the unspeakable with the capital U or the power with a capital P, you know, that he was talking about. We would be unsupported. You know, Luther, Luther said, it's all, it's all gift, we're all beggars. We literally don't have any, on his deathbed, when he was pressed about this whole thing, he said, you know, we're all beggars. We would have nothing unless God filled us up with it or gave it to us. So when he makes us something new, on one hand, he's recreating, rejoining what was once together prior to death, which is body and soul, as he's created you. And we know from the scriptures, from 1 Thessalonians 4, that not all of us will be dead when Christ returns. Some of us will still be alive in that moment. And, I mean, imagine that. It'll be terrifying and exciting at the same time. And, you know, I've, I've said this before, like, uh, I'll pray, like, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Like, when you hear somebody's sick or something like that, you know, you say, oh, come, you say, it rolls off the lips, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Because you think, come and rescue your people. But that's sort of a double-edged sword, that prayer, isn't it? Like, on one hand, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, because... I'm on the in, I'm on the winning team here, and I know what my future holds for me. I know that I have redemption that awaits me. I know that I'm good. But I also know a whole bunch of people that won't be. And that's frightening. And if you truly live, like the words of Philippians 2 today, if you truly live for others as Christ lived for you, then while you might be selfishly coveting, I want to be with my Lord. I just want to be there. I just want to be comforted by that. Two things I would advise you. One, don't forget the inaugurated 
eschatological times that you're living in. You're in the kingdom. You got the goods right now. So don't forget that part, which might slow you down from going, oh yeah, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, but I'd rather die because then I don't have to worry about this, that, or the other. I had, a, uh, had it on my mind this morning because, you know, you guys don't ever have times when you can't sleep, but I woke up early this morning and here I'm thinking about finances because that's what usually sort of plagues you when you lay there. Well, what about this and that and the other? And I'm like, you know, Amy will be thrilled to hear this. You know, it'd just be easier if I made sure that all the insurance policies were in order and and because um, I'm worth more to her dead than I am alive, which isn't true. That's how we all end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I may be, yeah, I may be giving myself more credit than it's than I deserve when I say that. But, but I mean, you know, it's it's scary to think how quickly your mind can go to that. Like, what's the quick, easy solution to this? And that'd be the quick, easy solution. But I'm like, you know what? That's pointless. You know, for me to live as Christ to die as gain. I know what I'd be getting. I know that she'd be taken care of. I know that everything would be okay. But she doesn't want that. <laughs> Yeah, no, don't push that one too hard either. I'm just, I've said it before, I'm a way better husband, which isn't saying much because if, if it's just comparing me against a dead guy, I'm a way better husband, I'm a way better father, I'm a way better pastor, I'm a way better friend alive. I'm more useful alive than I am dead. So yeah, come Lord Jesus and come quickly because when I see the pain and the suffering and the difficulty that people are experiencing in this world, I want it to end. But at the same time, I want to make sure that people know that inaugurated eschatological business that formulates who we are and what we are. And, and how are they going to know unless someone goes? And how are they going to go unless they are sent? And how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? And I'm back to what the scriptures say. You've got to keep bringing the good news to people. You've got to keep encouraging them, to use the words of this morning's sermon. You've got to keep and it may seem frustrating at times. You may feel like you get one step forward and three steps back, but, but we want to bring to them something that's new. And I go back to this word new, and maybe, you know, I've told you this before too, you walk outside the walls of this church and you engage somebody that's outside of this place that's, maybe they've heard it before, maybe they've been hurt at a former church. Maybe they don't want anything to do with it anymore. I've heard, I've heard more stories about why people don't attend church. Um, Amy and I were talking yesterday, we, we took a drive on a hike, and I don't know how we got onto this subject, but do, are you guys familiar with the um, Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, which basically categorizes, just like a systematic theologian categorizes theology, and they put it into a work like what I copied and gave to you, there is what they call the DSM Manual, which is what psychologists and psychiatrists use to categorize and catalog different, you know, psychoses and different problems with people. So like a psychiatrist, psychologist will use that in evaluating someone. I don't, I don't remember how we got onto it, but I said, can you imagine what kind of manner of dysfunction people had to observe and interview over the course of years to compile that kind of information? And in a way, you know, we had to be familiar with it when I took counseling classes at seminary, and, and I don't use it for for professional purposes, because I'm not a licensed mental health practitioner. I can do counseling with you up to the point where I realize my shortfalls, and then I refer on. And I tell people I'll do theological counseling with people, because that's where my area of study and expertise is. And theologically speaking, my expertise is very simple. I have people that come to me, and they've got some kind of problem, and I have to get them to one conclusion, one diagnosis every time, and that is sin. Oh, you know, my marriage is falling apart. Sin. Oh, you know, I have addiction problems. Sin. You know? If you can get people to see sin, then you can open the door to them to the prescription for sin, which is Christ. So my job is relatively easy in terms of doing that. But, but back to just that DSM manual, how, how much dysfunction exists. And when Christ returns in the new creation, he's going to make all things new, as in new in quality. So maybe for that person that's suffering from something, anything, maybe it can even be defined by the DSM, they, they experience a newness, a refreshing newness. And, 
And again, we're back to, see where I keep trying to tie these things back together, the future versus the inaugurated. They can look with you with hope towards the future. So you got somebody that's dealing with addiction and they can't seem to break out of the cycle of addiction. You want to work with them and you want to help them and you want to say, hey, I want to help you see that Christ has died for your addiction. He's taken it to the grave. Now that's good news. It is good news and it's meaningful to them and it may not stop them from returning to the thing that they've been addicted to. And that's troublesome and that's hard and that's what makes doing, you know, doing the work of the church difficult. Uh, it is difficult work. It's hard work. It's messy work. And getting involved, I look at a couple of pastors in the room right here and um, there's an old meme. You guys know what memes are? Memes? <laughs> we joke and call memes. <laughs> There's a, a picture one of my friends has posted one time. I wish I had it at my disposal that I could put up here. It says, you know, a pastor on his ordination day, and it's a young guy that's got his collar on, and he's, you know, it's like one of the pictures they put in the seminary catalog. And then they show a pastor after a year in the field, and it's some aged guy that's like, uh-huh, you know. You know, I'm looking at a couple of pastors that have, that have lived and worked with people over time, and I think they would be the first to tell you and I'm not just glorifying being a pastor because this is the job of every Christian is to engage and work with the people that are within our sphere of influence as Christians. I did church work before I was ever a pastor, you guys. I mean, I traveled overseas. I did church work when I went to work. When I would just go to my old job as a regional VP with the building materials wholesaler. I did church work because I'd talk about things that I experienced in church. I would share my faith with people. We would talk about things. I would engage them on a level like I sort of do with you guys sometimes collectively. You know, um, where we'll talk about things that are the deep things. Um, I'll have conversations with them kind of like what I had with my wife, you know, on yesterday's drive. I, you just do that with people and it becomes such an organic, natural part of who you are is you know, I am a baptized child of Christ, and I can't be anything other. So I'm going to talk about those things with people. And what you find is as you engage people, it gets, it's hard. And that's where I was talking about pastors. When we, when we do this for a living, it's hard, and it ages us. And it's, you know, some days I just don't even want to think about, oh, I know what today's got in store for me. You get those days when you got on the calendar. I know I'm going to be meeting with so-and-so, and it's going to be about this, and it's going to be difficult. And... um. And sometimes it's easy to just turn our backs on that stuff and say, I don't want to engage it because doing, doing Christianity is hard. Because what it might mean is that you have to meet somebody where they're at in their addiction cycle. You might have to forgive your neighbor or your family member. Who, does, who wants to do that? You know, pastors see that. I don't know about these two pastors, but I've presided over funerals, you guys where we had to have police escorts at the church. That's how dumb it is. I've seen the worst kind of sin from people, usually at the time of the death of a loved one, when kids get divided from each other or were divided against their parents. And you can go talk, you know, what your role is as a Christian to these people, and it doesn't matter in that moment when they see that sibling that they've hated for the last 25 years. And you see your member go do something stupid. And your job as a pastor isn't to walk away from that. Your job as a pastor is to walk into the middle of that and speak the law to them. And say, what are you doing here? And this is why people don't want to do this in their regular lives, or why a lot of people, I suppose, don't want to go on and be pastors. A few years ago, I was interviewed by the seminary to become the associate provost over um, enrollment at the seminary. And they ended up not pushing the job forward, and it fell by the wayside for several reasons. And then a year later, they came back, and they'd, they'd called one of my former classmates and was a current professor into the position. He called me, and he says, we did all the interviewing with you, and we would, we'd like you to come and be the director of, of um, recruitment at the seminary, which on the surface sounded pretty cool. I'm like, oh, I might be interested in that. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, I don't know who I'd recommend do this job because it's not for everybody. And it's sort, of, it's sort of indicative of the Christian life, but it's on steroids a little bit because you do it all the time. And um, you're, you're working with people to show them, and it's hard always to show them the truth of the gospel. Sometimes you've got to bring the law before they're ready for the gospel. 
but you want them always and forever to see that God's got something new in store for them. And what a joy it is as a pastor. There's, it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, honestly, to be a pastor, because you get the moment when the light bulb goes on for somebody, and, and they're like, I've never, it's never struck me that way before. And you finally put into words, or the, and you get a moment like that, and it's like, yes, I love my job. And then you can go the next day and you can have somebody tell you, you know, pastor, so-and-so wore the wrong clothes when they put out that candle in church, and I'm deeply offended by it. <laughs> what? Or, or um, you know, pastor, can you do something about that crying baby in church? <laughs> you guys think I'm joking. I am not joking about that stuff. People will say stuff like that, and I just, I can't. And, and I'm telling you that it, you've got work to do then. You know you've got work to do. Um, Isaiah. Let's think setting with this one when we, when we carry into this one. Um, Isaiah, remember, was speaking in an ancient time to an ancient people who had, were living sort of um, an analogy to the Christian life that we experience. They had transgressed God's will. They had been run off into an exile, literally, taken slavery captive by Babylonians and Assyrians. And by now, in Isaiah's writings, we're at chapter 65, we're at the end of his writings, and he's preparing the people for their return. And for them, it was physically, they were going to return to the land that had been promised to them, to their former homeland, Israel, literally. Okay? But remember, that's analogous to what God's got in store for us. We're an exiled people. We're wandering in the wilderness people. We've got a promise of crossing over the River Jordan into the Promised Land, we've got God's guarantee that He's got something in store for us in the future. And so when we read this, we read it as an inaugurated thing that happened for the time of the people in Israel back in their day, but it also carries with it a future expectation for those of us in ours. So as I read this, I want you to sort of bear that double mind in it. For behold, I create it. This is God speaking to Israel. Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. There was a little, literal restoration of God's people Israel to the land of Israel. Okay? It had to have happened because, you know, in the post, post return of God's people, Jesus, the shoot that came from the stump that was Israel, Jesus was born. Right? So these words have come to fruition, but still have a future, like a now, not yet feeling that goes with them. This is probably a fun thing to start with only about five minutes left in our time together. So the, the question, what will I look like? And I've talked about it before with you guys during the course of the study. I know there are different thoughts that are out there. I know that one of the things that's out there is, I'll be 33 years old because Jesus was 33 years old. And I have roundly rejected that on the basis of Scripture. And I want you to hear me loud and clear on that. This is the last time I want to talk about it is that you will be whatever the Lord wants you to be, period. 33? Maybe. Four? Maybe in thinking. 
<laughs> um, you know, 78, your years will be like the years of a tree. I was looking at a book yesterday when we were trying to find a place to go hiking, and um, I've got the Tim Ernst books that I've gotten, and, and um, I found a place, sadly, it's in the southern part of the state, and it was too far to drive, but do you know what the oldest living thing in the state of Arkansas is? Is a tree. Yeah, do you know, does anybody know where it's at or has been to it? I don't see Newman Coleman here. Is it by Little Rock? They had a picture of it. It's this massive hulking tree. I think it's actually south of Little Rock because it looks like a cypress that's sort of in the, from the picture. It might be in another state by now. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But what will I look like? So I can tell you, you're going to be new. Now, what does that mean? See, new could mean that I'm something brand spanking new, never before seen. Or it could mean new as in renewed. You see, there's a lot of ways that you can take that word. And we have to take it for what it means. And it leaves some level of mystery for us. Yes, sir. Um, Thy will be done. Yeah, I mean, it's very simple. So my backup for saying that is, thy will be done. So whatever is will, whatever the will of the Lord be done, think about what the problem of original sin is. What was the problem of original sin? Yeah, um, Afki Amar Elohim, did God really say you shouldn't eat the fruit of the tree? Did God really say? So the question that was in Adam and Eve's mind was, did God really say that? Well, did God really say that he was the God and you are not? He did but you don't like it. So you want to be the God and you want to know good from evil. So eat this fruit and God will know that your eyes will be open and you'll have the, you'll have the final say. You'll get to be the God and he's no longer the God. So man was elevated above God and one of the curses of man being elevated above God in his own thinking, what was going to happen, was I get to be the judge and jury for everything. I get to decide what I want. Now, if God makes all things new and he restores them to their proper means, then uh, we got to do a returning around of things and we got to go from my will be done, whatever I want, God, whatever I think, gets turned around to whatever God says, thy will be done. And I am going to be very happy with that. And that is the opposite of the way that it is right now. And that's why I said, you want to know what heaven's going to look like? It's going to be bizarre, old world, because it's going to be the opposite of what you know, which is probably why we have such a hard time envisioning it. Because we are so deeply steeped in, you know, what this world comes with. You know, I, here's what I like to think with this, in the basis of God's word, because I've shared the story with you before of our old family friend, Tara, that was born with some, some um, disfigurements, bodily disfigurements. And I've struggled with what she, am I going to recognize her in the, in the resurrection? And I've told even of my professor at seminary that said, um, you know, who's to say that God didn't make her the way that he wanted her with three fingers on one hand and in a large forehead? That's God's will, not yours. Who cares? Why do you have to have this idea of what you think perfect is? And I've wrestled with it because I knew that when Jesus came, you know, when you look at what Jesus did with people that had suffered some type of, you know, disfigurement or inability. So you got a guy that can't see. What's Jesus do? He spits on the ground. He makes mud, covers his eyes, goes Tells the guy, wash in the pool of Siloam. And now the guy that was born blind from birth can see. You got a guy with a withered hand, Jesus, he restores his hand and it's perfect. You get a guy that's lame, can't walk. Jesus makes it so they can walk. You got a guy that's dead and he raises Lazarus from the dead. So, you know, if I have to summarize what Jesus has come to do, he's come to restore and renew. And so to me, when I think, what will I look like? He's going to restore and renew me. To what? Whatever he wants. And and I'm going to be, I really do think this, I'm going to be super happy with it. I mean, I hope that's what I, I I trust him at his word. And see, that's what, uh, if I had a small catechism, I'd look this up, and I know i got to end here. Um. If I had the small catechism, we could take a look at this. And uh, Luther used to say something kind of like this. I'm paraphrasing what he'd say. 
he'd say, um, you know, how do you know if you got the right God or something to that effect? And he said, you have the right God if you look to him for all good and nothing else. In other words, everything that God gives to you is all good. And if we can receive it as such, well then, I've said this before too, the lines between good and bad in my life have been blurry because God has allowed some things that the world would look at and they'd go, that's really bad, what happened to you? And I go, you know, if it weren't for it being really bad, maybe I wouldn't have learned the lesson that I needed to learn. Because sometimes, you know, when things are going along swimmingly and I'm doing really good, then I don't really think too much about it. I, oh, and I don't really learn much from it. Case in point, like I used to play saxophone in a jazz band. It just came naturally for me. It was easy. I liked it. I liked playing jazz. I liked improvisation. I won the Louis Armstrong Jazz Award for the state of Nebraska for all musicians back in the day. I haven't picked up my saxophone in a long time because you know what I didn't do with my saxophone? Because it was easy for me, I didn't try. And I didn't really learn anything from it. And now I sort of suffer and wish that I played it some. But there were other things that have been hard for me. And, and those hard things, not musically necessarily, but those things that have been hard for me, I find more reward by going through the difficult time with it and seeing after going through something that's been difficult, you know, the joy that can be found on the other side. The accomplishment because I endured or something like that. And I've, I've tended to learn more from the hard stuff than the stuff that was easy for me. Those are bad examples, but it's well, all I had at the drop of a hat. And i got to probably quit now so we can go do our stuff. But we'll come back to what you're going to look like um, next time. So we good? The good news is I don't ever leave you time for questions, and then I don't have to get questioned on what I gave you. <laughs> we'll see you shortly.